Now look, this model camera becomes very possible with a supremely fast and simple lens. Um, and it's all made possible by the curved sensor. A simpler lens, a faster lens, a more dependable lens becomes possible when you curve the sensor. Now, making curved sensors is not the easiest thing in the world. No free lunch here. Is it going to be easy? No. But is it possible? Yeah. And making curved sensors is going to be the whole key, and we're going to talk about that next. Now, those of you who are in the industry, uh, this is, I'm speaking to you, not the investors, potential investors. Those of you who are in the photo industry, could you just relax a little bit? This is public information. I'm doing this on a DVD, and I'm going to put it on YouTube to make it very, very, very public, just so we can have relaxed conversations. I can divulge what we have. You incur no liability, and you sign no non-disclosure agreements if we decide to partner. So stay cool. Let's talk for a minute about how we got here. Um, and let's look at what a basic camera operates like today. This is, the, this is the same format that Matthew Brady used in the 1860s to photograph America's Civil War. Louis Daguerre was creating photographs in France 20 years before Brady. And I think Brady used some kind of an egg white mixture on flat glass with some chemicals. Brady had over 10,000 of these images when the war was over. It was a negative. He could make one picture per plate. And so what you really had then was the negative was a consumable. That's important to remember economically because you had to make them cheap. There was another reason that they came out flat, uh, besides just being the most practical way to manufacture. Uh, Lincoln's picture on the American $5 bill came from one of Brady's shots. And then a long time later, George Eastman invented Kodak film. Again, the only practical way to make film was flat, and the film was consumed. Negatives were used one time and needed to be made cheap. Flat made economic sense back then. Another French guy took the first photo 10 years before Daguerre, and he did this out of his window with a 10-hour exposure. But there's another reason that all tendencies were towards flat, and that is there's this thing called a camera obscura which is not really a camera. It's a room sealed off from light with a pinhole in one wall, and an image of the world outside is created on the other wall. It just happens. That's the way cameras basically work. Mozi in China did the first one in 400 BC. Ten years later, Aristotle had one in Greece. And then 1,400 years later, Al-Zahasan, an Egyptian, studied it. The camera obscura was also built with images on a flat wall. So what we had was a bias towards flat that made sense back then. Now, I want to show you what the problems are with a flat sensor. This is the first thing. It's called chromatic aberration in a simple lens. And you get the rainbow effect. As the, as the light gets bent further from the lens, it, it spreads out and causes all these kind of problems. And that, that's a very simple problem and requires more complex lenses. A second problem with flat sensors and flat film is the distance to the sensor or the film is much shorter in the center than it is at the edges. So you've got more intensity in the center. So you've got to add another element to the lens and things to compensate for that. Now, we have a third problem with flat sensors, and that is in digital sensors, we tend to undercut the pixels, and we get into different uh, colors, and we get some uh, distortion of color fidelity. This actually was a problem with film, too, in which uh, the different frequencies tended to focus at slightly different spots. Film folks, Fuji and Kodak, pretty much solved that by getting thinner and thinner in their films. But this is a problem today with digital sensors at the edges. A fourth problem, and this is less serious than the others, is you do get light bouncing around from the edge. Uh, that causes a minor amount of fogging on any image. Uh, this light, it's pretty well matted inside the camera, so most of that's absorbed, but not all of it. The light that's central is no problem when it reflects. If it reflects coherently, it goes right out the lens. Now, those are huge fundamental problems. But 
through the 19th and 20th century and with thousands of engineers, optical engineers working on things, the problems I mentioned, those four problems have been solved. They are fixed. But look at what it's done to the complexity of the average lens. This is just a standard wide angle lens and this is my artistic sketch of uh, how it goes together. Look at, look at all the elements. We've got, we've got a big element here. It's probably, I don't know this, an aspheric. We have very sophisticated formulas on each. We've got a second element here. Then we have a third element that's compound made up of two pieces of glass or quartz or fluorite or, or acrylic or maybe even germanium, maybe even a combination, I don't know. Then a complex lens here that, uh, with two concaves, and then you got another com uh, complicated lens that's fused together. Now, man, that is a lot of engineering. That's a lot of glass to go through. It's a lot of work. This isn't even a zoom, and this is a very standard wide-angle lens. That is just a lot of glass and a lot of work to solve those problems, but they do solve them. Now, why don't we take a second and take a look at the way nature solved these problems. Okay, nature does it this way. Here's a human eyeball. Now, uh, your eye and my eye have about 25 million rods and cones in them. That's about twice the pixel count I have in my very expensive Canon 5D. I don't know if it's legitimate to compare rods and cones to uh, pixels, but my eyeballs do it with one lens and a cornea to protect it. And it resolves more than my very expensive camera. And that's because it's got a curved retina. Now a retina, I mean uh, the human eyeball is about this big. This is what we're looking at here. Uh, if we look at my sensor in my camera, it's about 43 millimeters, so it's about like this. And is, so it takes up a lot more space than, uh, than is required for the eyeball. And, and it, it just, uh, the eyeball just resolves better. Now, guess what? That's, that's going to change uh, because pixel density is just growing just like personal computer uh, uh, data does. About every 18 months it doubles. Same thing, Moore's Law. And so we will get there. Uh, if you looked at an eagle, I, about this size, it has 200 million pixels or rods and cones, excuse me, uh, to resolve in it, and it can see a fish in the water from a mile away, or what would that be, 1,700 meters. What do we need? Very simple. We need a curved sensor. Solves all of those optical problems. And let's talk a little bit about the hard part now. How do we make that?